and welcome to another Green Thumb Lecture Series. My name is John Schaefer and I'm with the Harris County Public Library. Joining me today um, will be a member of the Harris County Master Gardeners Association for a very special presentation and discussion that I think we're all looking forward to. Uh, we're here online, usually every third uh, Tuesday of the month at 11 uh, a.m. Uh, just a reminder that uh, our, uh, next, next month we will be doing uh, excuse me, uh, next month will be September 19th, and that will be Growing Roses in Texas. Growing Roses in Texas is next show, but this show, today we're talking about, our topic is exploring ethnic vegetables, and uh, we're very excited about that. We've got a great uh, presenter. However, uh, I want to go over a couple of things real quick. Number one, we love questions. Uh, please, please, please ask all the questions you can, um, but we would like you to do it. If you could on Facebook, go ahead and type those in the comments section or YouTube, wherever you are watching this presentation, go ahead and please comment along the way. Uh, we are going to be stopping throughout the presentation to answer some of these questions. So uh, you could be getting uh, answers to the questions via, from Master Gardeners online or live uh, from our presenter. Also, once again, I remind everybody next month, it's going to be September 19th, Growing Roses in Texas. Um, but of course, today we're talking about ethnic, exploring ethnic vegetables. So I am very excited to introduce our presenter today. Uh, let me get this in here. Uh, this is Mr. Benny Machusik. Uh, Benny Cumbie became a Harris County Master Gardener in 2020, uh, but he's been a lifelong gardener. He was born in Houston and grew up in Deer Park. After graduating from Deer Park High School, Benny attended Texas A&M. That's where he met his wife, Lucy. Uh, and then he went to the University of Houston, where he earned a degree in uh, math and computer science. However, gardening has always been a primary passion. Uh, Benny has been especially interested in why American houses have so much grass, which you can't eat, which I love that in the front and the backyards. Uh, after buying his home, uh, Benny applied himself to seeing how much food one man could produce uh, in his yard without upsetting the uh, the local HOA, which I also love right there. Uh, this has led to an interest in traditional gardening, to hydroponics, to aquaponics, and now permaculture, uh, much to the benefit of the local food bank, which he donated it too. So very good there. Benny currently lives in Pearland, so he is right here in the uh, Houston area. Uh, with his wife Lucy and his dog Dolly. And of course, he's got 25 catfish, uh, he says, in the backyard that are just about ready for the dinner table. Uh, and when he's not gardening, he is working at Cisco as a supply chain manager, project manager. Benny, how are you? Welcome. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think we were kind of talking earlier. I'm, I'm joining you today from uh, First Cup Coffee Shop in Pearland. Uh, Comcast was digging a big hole at the end of my uh, my neighborhood street this morning, so I don't have internet at the house. So this was the, the quickest internet place I could find. If you wonder, do I drink a lot of coffee? Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> you might be hearing some voices in the background. Sorry. Yeah, the answer is yes. And if you think you smell coffee, yeah, you probably do. You probably do. I wish I had my cup here. I wish I had any more. Um, well, and, and hey, who doesn't love being at a coffee shop? Uh, so yes, there might be a little bit of background noise, uh, but go ahead and please just, if you have a question, if you can't hear, if you need us to speak up, um, type that in the comment section. We'll uh, try and work with that as we can. Um, we've got a lot of stuff to cover, and I know we're—I know you've got a hard out at 12 o'clock. That's showbiz terms, meaning you've got another meeting you got to go to at 12. So uh, I will be interrupting you throughout the uh, the show, perhaps if we get some good questions coming in. Uh, also, once again, the Harris County Master Gardeners are monitoring the chat, and they are answering questions as we go. So uh, feel free, even if we don't get to your answers, uh, your questions, all questions will get answered. Um, with that said, um, I think we should go ahead and get started, Benny. I mean, uh, less of me and more of you. How about that? I'm fine with that. You know, my wife has asked me, do I really need to talk about gardening all the time? So I've tried to tone it down with her. But hey, since you guys are here, you guys can step in for her. So thank you very much. 
I appreciate you guys attending. I love talking about garden for, uh, gardening for 50 different reasons. You know, it's one of the few places where all those classes that you took in high school and college really come back and are in use. All your chemistry, your biology, your geology, meteorology, everything, everything comes back in to support your gardening. So it's just a fun topic for lots of different reasons. As John said, uh, I'm with Harris County Master Gardeners. Uh, what Harris County Master Gardeners does is they locate volunteers that are usually gardening fanatics. They give them some additional training in gardening and then send them out in the big wide world to disseminate science-based information. And that's the key phrase, science-based information. Agriculture has been kind of a big topic for the last 10,000 years. Uh, it's one of the big reasons that some of the agricultural schools were set up in the United States. A lot of smart people, uh, PhD types, have done a lot of research, and we want to get that out into the public's hands. Had a guy tell me the other day, uh, it was at a farmer's market, he was telling me how he plants by the moon, phases of the moon. And that's fantastic. It sounds like a wonderful idea, but there's no scientific evidence to support that that makes uh, the idea that that makes any difference whatsoever. So that's not the kind of thing that we will tell you. The kind of things that we'll tell you are things that have been tested. Uh, tested again by agricultural schools, trial gardens, test gardens, that sort of thing. Ideas have been proven out. So that's who uh, Harris County Master Gardeners is. Uh, I think John also kind of mentioned rules of engagement. The software that we're using today is kind of very high-end production software. It's not really meeting software. It's not kind of a good way to, to unmute you guys if you have a question. But this talk is for you guys, right? I've already done my gardening. I'm hoping to offer you some information about vegetables that have done well for me, how I grew them, what they tasted like. So I do want your questions. If you would please chat them in the chat. Uh, we have several people standing by to echo that stuff to me or John will jump in and relay those questions. Uh, so please ask them as they occur to you. Uh, if you wait to the end of the presentation, sometimes it's hard to remember what the question even was or exactly what you meant. Uh, so please chat that as the idea occurs to you. We'll try to knock them out as we go. All right. So again, Harris County Master Gardeners is quite a large organization. Uh, there are lots of departments. Uh, Green Thumb Gardening Series is just one of the, uh, the departments. And you see a list there of uh, some of the talks uh, that they offer for free. Free is good. Yeah. As Yukon Cornelius would say, wahoo. All right, in addition to green thumb gardening, uh, we also have a demonstration garden. Uh, the name of it is the Genoa Friendship Garden. You can put that into your Apple Maps and Apple Maps will find it for you. We're kind of between seasons right now. Uh, I think, you know, the spring growing has kind of ended. The heat is taking its toll, but when fall kind of kicks in, the master gardeners will, will be back out there planting and it's very nice. Uh, to go out there and see what they're planting, when they're planting, and you are totally invited. Uh, the hours are fairly short, but you can see them listed there on the screen. A lot of the volunteers work very hard. We would love to have you come out and see what we're up to. All right, today we're going to talk about um, ethnic vegetables. I would like for you to consider this, this to be one tile in a huge mosaic of other topics. You know, the, the planet that I come from, you know, we haven't been nice to the environment, you know, uh, you know, climate change is becoming a bigger topic and what have you. So there are a lot of things that come and fit together. And so ethnic vegetables, yes, it's very nice to look around the world and see what's growing, what's yummy, what could be in your garden. But it also kind of plays into the bigger question of, you know, what, what will agriculture be like in the future? What will all our homes be like in the future? You know, gardeners tend to grow what they know, and what they know is what comes from the grocery store. Those are the things that you grew up eating as a kid. Those are the things you know, the things that you grow. But there are other things around the world that would love to be grown in Houston as well. So this thing where, you know, like a head of lettuce has to travel, you know, on average a thousand miles to get where it's going. You know what? Maybe there are some other things around the world that would be yummy, good to grow, and wouldn't have to travel so far. Things that could deal with the Houston heat and what have you. So very fun topic, but like I said, just one tile in a larger mosaic. All right. So ethnic vegetables. So one of the questions is, you know, why ethnic vegetables in the first place? And the thing that really um, kind of put me onto the, the, the topic, uh, this has been years ago now, but my wife and I, we went to Machu Picchu. Uh, you know, I drive a crummy car. I live in a little house. 
you know, where we spend our money is each year we try to take, you know, a big trip and go see something just really neat. And, you know, Machu Picchu, beautiful place, dramatic mountains covered with yellow and purple uh, wild orchids, uh, lives up to its postcards in every way. Um, but as we were doing our things, we were going to take, we, we were going to go out and we were going to drive and see some things. And we thought we would have a little picnic on the way and then drive and see more things. And so we went to the little local market, the little mercado. And we thought we would run in there and get some apples and oranges and maybe some tortillas and little cheese. And in this mercado, they had all the things that you would expect. You know, you know, apples, oranges, bananas, mangoes, pineapples, you name it. But I realized walking around about half the things I was looking at, I had no idea. It's not that I knew what they were and was unfamiliar with them. There were things I had no earthly idea what I was looking at. And so for this picnic, what we ended up doing is basically getting about half things that we knew and half things we didn't know. And it was such a little adventure to sit there on the side of the roads, you know, side of the road, look at the mountains and try some of these fruits and what have you, flavors I've never had. Some of the fruits I had to ask, how do you even peel them? How do you even open up? You know, what do you do with them? You know, the seed, do you eat the seed? So there are interesting things out there that are totally yummy. And, you know, if nothing else, I'd like to know what I'm missing out on. You know, I live in third largest city in the U.S. and arguably the greatest country in the U.S. How is it I don't know about these things? You know what? They're out there. We just have to look. Luckily, we don't have to look real far. But again, lots of reasons to learn about this stuff. You know, exotic new flavors, food production, food security. The more different things you grow, the more likely something is to work well. Uh, lots of reasons. And then you know, the very last bullet point is the one I love, design for the future. You know, how, how are we going to live in the future? What will we eat in the future? You know, we can't keep going like we have been. So here's a little chance to think into the future. All right. Now, again, luckily, and I find this tremendously interesting, is this Houston Chronicle article on the right-hand side. Uh, I forget when this was uh, published, but I remember seeing, you know, 145 languages spoke here in Houston, in Houston households. That's pretty tremendous. You know, we're a large city, like I said, third largest in the U.S. We're a port city, which means lots of things are coming into Houston, lots of... Uh, uh, goods and people as well. And what that means is because we have such an influx of people, different cultures and what have you, I mean, they got to eat something. What that means is that there are little ethnic grocery stores around Houston. And with even just minimal effort, you know, you can find these places and go shop and look to see what they've got. Now, some of these ethnic items, um, perhaps you've even tripped across them. You know, some of them are, are, are even an HEB, um, you know, Fiesta Mart, if you go to Fiesta Mart, you know, they've got a very nice ethnic se section. Um, Hong Kong Market, I have to admit, their produce is not amazing, but they have all these greens and root vegetables that I don't recognize. Most of them, I don't know what they are. So it's always a whole little adventure to go. Um, there's another place, Joseph's Nursery here in Pearland, that's kind of usually my first uh, stop for buying plants, one, because it's convenient. Uh, but two, it's actually owned by a Vietnamese family. And so they have uh, kind of a lot of uh, off plants as well. In addition to your lantanas and tomatoes and peppers and what have you, they'll have, you know, Asian vegetables and, uh, you know, Asian peppers. And a lot of times it's, it's not real, real well labeled. Sometimes it will be labeled Asian vegetable. You know, Asia is kind of big, 5,000 years of history. Can you be a little more specific? But they're so nice and they're so happy to tell you what it is and how to grow it, more importantly, how to eat it. Uh, so Joseph's Nursery is a good place to be. If nothing else, hop on YouTube. You know, there are a lot of videos on YouTube. Uh, even if it's in another language, you can sit there and watch what they're doing. If the guy's digging a hole, you understand digging a hole. And when he takes some plant and says the name, you know what it is. And then you can hop on eBay, order some seeds or perhaps some cuttings and, uh, Get those items sent right to your house. Um, if you do want to do the grocery store route, remember that when you walk into a grocery store, most of that stuff is still alive. When you walk to the back of a Kroger's and there's the turmeric and the ginger and a bunch, you know, taro and a bunch of other roots, what have you, that stuff is still alive, right? They don't kill it before they put it in the grocery store. So if you buy those things and plant them, nine times out of ten, they'll grow. Now, I remember one time uh, I got some taro and I think it was kind of covered with a wax. I think they had dipped it in some wax to keep it from sprouting in the grocery store. 
And so uh, if you can get organic vegetables, a lot of times they have not uh, been wax dipped or they have not been sprayed to pre uh, prevent sprouting. But all that stuff, even if they have been dipped and sprayed, usually if you plant them, they'll go ahead and grow. And they might be slow to grow, but they will go ahead and grow. Um, so like I said, you know, your average grocery store is a great place to start. And then there are also a lot of little ethnic stores around, you know, you get your phone out, open up, you know, Apple map and just type in African grocery store or Asian grocery store. They're usually little mom and pop places, but you know what? They have things that you have never seen. And it is a lot of fun, uh, just to get some of those items, you know, talk to the store owner about what to do with them and then plant them and, uh, see how it goes. Uh, now, since you can get them at a grocery store, it's nice to taste them and see if you like them. Um, it's not a lot of fun to grow something that's not good to eat, right? When it finally matures, you want to be able to check, uh, pick it and take it in the house. Um, you know, at the grocery store, you can get some of those. If, if it's a purple sweet potato, you know, you can get some and cook them and see if you like it. And if you do like it, go back, get some more, put them in the ground. But the advantage of having all these resources around is number one, you can find things. These things are uh, available with some looking and also you can try them before you grow them. Uh, just a quick word, uh, cuttings versus seeds. Uh, remember when you get cuttings, you're actually getting part of the original plant, right? When you get seeds, seeds vary, you know, you know offspring of any type, they, they always vary from the parent a little bit. If you get seeds, you're not 100% sure that you're getting good quality seeds or that it's going to look just like the parent. Um, also, you, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, agricultural crops have been hybridized. And so the seeds, you know, they're, they're not going to you know, match the parent in any way, shape, form or fashion. If you can get cuttings, if you need to get seeds, that's fine. But if you can get cuttings simply because they're guaranteed to be true to the parent. In the picture, I thought this was kind of interesting. This is my wife eating some corn. Uh, again, back to Machu Picchu when we were in Peru, they had this white corn I've never seen anyplace else. And the kernels were huge. The you know, individual kernels were the size of my thumb. So I was fascinated you know, with the corn, number one, because they butter it and put salsa on it and serve it to you with cheese. But number two, the kernels were just so giant. It was interesting just to even look at this stuff. Uh, that and then um, the fact that they were drying it on top of all the homes, even the little bed and breakfast that we stayed at, they had a, a bunch of this corn drying in the sun. So interesting stuff out there. Sniff around a little bit and you'll find some goodies. Hey, so all real quick, if I could interrupt real quick, uh, sure. we had a, a question come in. By the way, lots of getting lots of likes, lots of thumbs up. So a great job. Um, I've heard that. Uh, there's been a lot of talk recently about gut bacteria, and I know this is a kind of a medical question more so, but one thing they talk about is like eating them, eating your medicine and food is medicine. And uh, in, in all of your, you know, research and going through this, do you see a lot about, you know, coming in as like some of the different, you know, the foods that you're eating are going to provide different micro, you know, help your microbiome. And do you see that come into play much? Uh, not me specifically. Mostly I'm concerned with what's for dinner. <laughs> There is a book, though. It's uh, in, it's one of the later slides. It's way towards the end. It's um, it's a National Geographic book. Um, it's I forget the exact title. Something about um, uh, an encyclopedia of medicinal herbs. You know, if you really want to know more than than what's for dinner, you got to get that book. You know okay. what? It's, you know, I'm always concerned with what can I get, what can I grow, and as you start flipping through that book, you'll learn. There, you know, there's huge cultural significance to the, you know, a lot of these herbs and vegetables. There's huge uh, ritual uh, importance to a lot of these things. Uh, a lot of them are medicinal. They're eaten for different reasons. Uh, there was one that's even good for keeping witches away. Well, that that's what I was getting at. I wanted to know how do you keep the witches away? <laughs> yeah, that's what you really care about, right? All so, right, yeah, Benny, let me let you get back into it, There's a book I'll point out when we get towards the end, and like I said, it's got so much more. Health included, I think you'll really Awesome. Like Thank you so much. All right. So again, I've been deliberately seeking out these vegetables from around the world to grow them to see if they're yummy, growing them to see if they're uh, you know, good to grow here in Houston, uh, resilient and productive. So I've kind of taken the ones that uh, I thought were good to eat, uh, grew well, and I've kind of divided them up by continent. Now, this whole continent thing is a little, uh, a little iffy. You know, you think of potatoes, you think of Ireland. But, you know, really, really, you know, potatoes come from South America. 
So, you know, the way I've got them divided up, take it with a grain of salt, but hey, let's zoom around the world and let me show you some of the items that I've found. All right. So in Africa, here's an easy one, right? Uh, if you're scared to try anything adventurous, you know what? You probably have some of this in your yard. Uh, this is society garlic. And the reason I'm bringing this up is, is not because it's exotic or because I don't think you know what it is. The, re the reason I'm bringing it up is most people don't know that it's edible. It's usually grown in most countries as an edible, which means you can go out with your scissors, uh, you know, grab it by the hair, snip off a handful, handful, and you can take that in and use it in the kitchen. So it, it is in the garlic family, so it's got a garlic flavor, but it has a more mild taste. Uh, the leaves and the blooms are both edible. So what that means is perhaps if you're serving a chicken breast, maybe you might want to get a nice handful of leaves and put it on the plate with the chicken breast on top of that, make it look very nice. Little flavor goes into your chicken. Um, and, and the blooms, you might snip a few blooms and put them into a salad. Completely edible. It'll add just a you know, little hint of garlic flavor. Absolutely beautiful. I think your guests will love it. So again, I think this is one of the ones that you've seen around. Perhaps you didn't realize it was edible. Now you know. Give it a try. And let me know what you think about it. Tiger melon. This is one of my favorites. It's one of my favorites just because I love looking at them. Uh, this basically grows kind of like a, kind of like a cantaloupe or, or like a cucumber. So it's going to be a vining plant. Uh, I would plant this at the same time that you, you plant your other melons and what have you. Uh, it's going to sprawl around. It's going to climb up a trellis. Uh, the melons, when they first grow, they're, they're green. They're kind of watermelon looking. Uh, they're green, but then when they become ready, they orange up very nicely. I think they're just crazy looking. Uh, these are about the size of a softball, which is kind of nice. I don't know if you've ever cut up a cantaloupe and thought, wow, that's a lot of cantaloupe. These are a smaller melon, again, about the size of a softball. Uh, cut them in half, scoop the seeds out. Uh, very much a honeydew flavor. So it's just an absolutely beautiful uh, melon that you can use in the kitchen. You might even like, you know, serve it with the skin on as you know, sort of a garnish or what have you. But yummy melon, uh, easy to grow, very nice to eat. I think you'll enjoy that honeydew flavor. All right. Um, Africa. So that was a short list. If I remember right from my um, geology class, I think that uh, something like only 6% of the farmland in Africa is, is good farmland. And what that means is, obviously, there are a lot of people that live there and, uh, you know, they farm because they're alive, they eat. What that means is that a lot of their vegetables are very uh, long growing and heat resistant. Uh, most of the things I'm showing you now are things that grow fairly quickly. If you are more patient, uh, Google African vegetables and, and see what else there is. There's some good stuff out there. All right. Uh, so uh, Asia. So here's another one that should not shock you. Banana, right? Everyone knows what a banana is. Uh, bananas are Walmart's number one best-selling product. They actually sell more bananas than apples and oranges put together because everybody likes bananas. I like bananas. Kids like bananas. We all like bananas. But bananas are a little hard to grow here in Houston because if you get a normal banana tree, number one, they get pretty tall. You know, banana trees, you know, they can have, they, they can get 15 or 20 feet tall. And so when they finally do make bananas, the bananas are way up off the ground. You can't climb a banana tree. You know, that makes no sense. It doesn't really have branches. How do you get up there and get those bananas? And a lot of times banana trees don't even survive to produce. They take about a year and a half uh, for banana tree to grow and produce uh, their bananas. And, you know, anytime we have uh, you know, one of our ERCOT ice ages in the middle of winter, you know, your banana tree freezes too much. So how do you how do you grow bananas here in Houston? Well, I would like to offer a suggestion to you. And the suggestion is purchase the truly tiny variety. They make a very small banana tree. The banana tree is only three to five feet tall, which means you can grow it in a container, which means when it gets cold, you can grab the container and drag it into the garage, and that way it'll survive winter. When it does fruit, It'll make a very nice little bunch of bananas. They are smaller bananas. Uh, the bananas are about the size of your whole thumb, not just the part to your, your first joint, but the whole thumb, and you'll get a whole bunch of those. But they taste exactly like normal bananas. And again, because it's a smaller plant, you can drag it in the garage and have it actually make it to completion. All right, moving on. Uh, bok choy. 
this is a really, really good one. In fact, this was one of the first kind of ethnic vegetables I started growing. And this is kind of, uh, bok choy is kind of halfway between lettuce and spinach. Number one, this stuff sprouts very well. It's very easy to find seeds for it. Um, I'm actually growing it hydroponically here in this picture on, on a little Ikea shelf. The sprouts are still uh, fairly small. Uh, usually what I do is I kind of sprout things hydroponically. And once they get a little bit bigger, I take them out and plant them in the garden proper. Uh, bok choy will make just an absolutely beautiful uh, kind of open head of lettuce thing. That's uh, it, it can be more than a foot wide, probably a, a foot and a half wide. And the nice thing is, you know, you can pull some leaves off the outside and put them in a salad and your plant continues to live and grow even more. Cut and come again is the term for that, right? When you harvest part of a plant, but leave the rest to continue growing for later harvest. Uh, the bok choy, you could put bok choy on a hamburger and your guests wouldn't even question it. Your guests would just assume that they're eating some kind of lettuce. They wouldn't think twice. So there's no pushback when you feed bok choy to your friends. Also, because it has a little bit more body to it than lettuce, it doubles as a spinach. So you can also throw it in a wok and stir fry it with you know, whatever you like to stir fry. And, and it'll be just like spinach. It cooks up like spinach. And, and people, when they eat it, they'll think that it is spinach. So one vegetable serves two purposes, very yummy. People eat it with no questions. Bok choy is a, a very good way to go. Next one, I tell you what, how about if I rotary breathe so John can jump in? Yeah, definitely. Well, first off, lots of great comments. I just want to say, Kelsey, thanks so much. Uh, she's interested in growing a, a, a tiger melon. Uh, she also says that cassava, rosel, and aramanth greens will grow very well in the area. Nice. And one question i had that came up was you were showing your ins you know growing some uh, stuff inside uh i hadn't really even thought about that i was thinking about the garden for all this so a lot of these things i'm guessing you're talking about can be grown inside as well is there some other things that you would recommend to some odd or some ethnic vegetables that would be good indoors if you have like say, a small place but you know all your leafy greens um all your leafy greens, you know, they don't appreciate heat. They, they really like the spring coolness or the fall coolness. And so usually in the summer, I'll, I'll bring them in and I'll, I'll grow them on a shelf in the kitchen. Number one, what that means is my wife can go and pick them without having to walk into the heat and the bug. It also means that the plants are in the coolness of uh, you know, the house. Now, they do need to have some kind of a grow light, right? If you put them by a window, maybe they'll get enough light. Probably not. But all your leafy greens would love to be inside, you know, that truly tiny banana. If you have a really good uh, sunny window, I've heard of people growing those actually indoors. Again, nice because it won't freeze. There's also another one that we'll get to called Kuka melon that grows this. It's a tiny little cucumber that looks like a little watermelon. Uh, it needs a trellis, but it'll only go up the trellis maybe three or four feet tall. So that would be another one that you would bring in the house, put in a nice window with a little trellis and have it indoors. And you get to stay out of the heat. So awesome. <laughs> I'll let you get back to it. Thank you so much, Benny. Okay. All right. Uh, Chinese water chestnuts. I think this is another one of those uh, that you, you know exactly what it is if you don't realize it or not. If you've ever gone and eaten some kind of a Chinese stir fry and there's always the kind of kind of cream colored crunchy stuff. Uh, it looks like maybe it looks like a slice of potato or something, but uh, the nice thing about uh, the Chinese water chestnuts is, is they don't get mushy when they're cooked. So they stay nice and crunchy. So again, if you've eaten Chinese food and thought that, hey, that bite that just went by, there was something crunchy in there, uh, that's what this is. And you can go to Hong Kong Market, for example, and get like a little bag of these water chestnuts. They kind of look like large acorns. They're, they're kind of getting up towards kind of golf ball size. All you need to do is put a couple of them in a tub you don't even need running water. Put a couple of them in a tub. They will sprout. They will fill up the whole tub and they will grow wonderfully. And at the end of the year, you will have a bunch of Chinese water chestnuts in there. Now, normally when you read instructions or watch the YouTube videos online, they tell you put two inches of soil, you know, fill it up with water and then put your, your Chinese water chestnuts in there. You know, I did that the first year. And what that means is at the end of the year, you have this muddy, this giant muddy, block of roots and you're trying to dig through there and find the water chestnuts and it's not a lot of fun so this year i'm actually growing them with no soil i've actually put them in a tub 
with uh, no soil at all. And uh, you can see right there, they look pretty happy. I've put them kind of near my, un kind of under my soaker hose. So the, the tub has a consistent water level, but these things are growing very nicely with no soil. And what that means is I can actually go in there very easily, look around a little bit, grab a few water chestnuts to slice into my dinner. I don't have to wait till the end of the year and I don't have to dig through a bunch of mud to find them. Much easier to grow. All right. Uh, ginger, another one, another one of the ones that I'm sure you're familiar with, but the average person doesn't realize that you can go to the grocery store and, and get some ginger and put it in the ground and, and it will grow. So why buy ginger when you can plant it just outside the kitchen door and, and grow plenty uh, yourself? It is real slow to sprout. So when, when you get your roots, uh, bury them four to six inches deep um, in kind of a, a, a semi-shade, not too much sun, kind of a semi-shaded area. Give it medium water. Um, just about the time you think it's not going to work, um, they will sprout up and they'll grow very nicely. In fact, it got to the point where I was chasing my neighbors and giving them uh, ginger. One lady cried and asked me how much ginger did I really think a person could eat. So uh, they grow very well. You're going to have plenty of it. Uh, Kang Kong. Here's another one that you can get at like the Hong Kong market. And you know what? This stuff, if we could find some way to ship it to Africa, we could solve world hunger and like nothing flat. It's an aquatic plant. So here I've actually got it growing in kind of a box of water. I have a box that I've lined with plastic and filled up with water. I put a little styrofoam lid on it. Uh, so it's, it's not even growing in the dirt. It has a stem, kind of a viney stem that's maybe about as uh, thick around as like a number two pencil. And then you can see the leaves there. They're uh, nice, soft leaves, a uh, little bit elongated with a pointy tip. Uh, this stuff, again, you know, you can, uh, you, you know, take some of it, just, you know, grab a handful, snip it off, throw it into a salad. So there's something that you could add to, you know, dinner, you know, anytime very easily. Uh, you can also stir fry it, not just the leaves, but the stems as well. And it kind of stir fries up like spinach. And this stuff is a little crazy. This stuff in a week, it'll double in size. Um, I end up uh, snipping a lot of this off and giving it to my chickens because there's a limit to how much I can eat. But it, uh, it loves the Houston heat uh, because you grow it in water. You don't need to water it. It's already sitting in water. It just grows very nicely, very easy to use. Doesn't have a lot of good, uh, doesn't have much flavor, but again, it's just nice to be able to, to snip something from, from the backyard, you know, bulk up your salad a little bit or add something to your stir fry. So it grows very well, very easy to use. Uh, kumquats, you know what, growing up, I had no idea what a kumquat was. So perhaps you've seen these around. Uh, if you haven't, uh, kumquat, it's a citrus tree and it grows a, a thing, it's like a little orange about the size, the, the, the first section of your thumb. So it grows a little fruit. Uh, it, it, it comes in supposedly two varieties. If you go down to the nursery to buy them, it comes, they, they have a sweet variety and a sour variety. They should rename them to sour and more sour because the, the sweet variety, it's, it's not sweet in any way, it's sour as well. But um, everyone loves them. There's lots of different ways to use them. In fact, I had the neighborhood kids coming over. You know, the kids eat these sour candies these days, these things that will like shrink your face up. And they found these kumquats and they absolutely loved them. They were over in my landscaping all the time, stripping my plant. Um, but it makes a, like a little orange. Uh, most people just, uh, you know, throw them in their mouth, just eat the whole thing, peel and all, spit out the seeds. Uh, if you don't like the, the orange peel that grows on the outside of them, you can kind of bite it off and then just squish the rest of it into your mouth. And that way you get the, the orangey flesh, but very tart. It's very nice to use them like cranberries. You can put them on a cutting board and slice them up. You can put them on buttered toast. You can put them into muffins. You can put them into cakes. Any place the cranberry might go, your cereal, you name it. Uh, you could put the kumquats in there as well. Uh, they are uh, 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 not cold tolerant. so. Uh, you need to keep the tree pruned a little bit, keep it small so you can grab it in the garage, drag it in the garage when winter comes. But they produce like crazy. Out of one little tree, you can see how big this tree was. That's a 20 inch pot there. So this tree probably came about halfway up my chest. I got two full Walmart bags of kumquats out of that one little tree. And then as soon as it rained really hard, the thing started blooming 
and, and, and made more fruit. So yes, it blooms in the spring by itself, but it doesn't seem to be like a one and then you're done for the year. Uh, you know, as soon as you, you know, fertilize it some, water it really good and it'll start going again. So just a tremendous producer. Everybody loves these things. I think this is one you'll like. All right, moving on, uh, lemongrass. You know, it seems like everyone knows about this, but nobody seems to know what to do with it. Uh, luckily, I have a cousin that's Asian, and she took a couple minutes to show me. And basically, the lemongrass, it grows in this huge bunch. But if you kind of wade in there a little bit, you'll find it grows in narrow bunches. And so if you find one of the bunches and kind of follow it down to the ground, you can pull it out of the ground quite easily. And what, and what you're left with is it's a thing that looks kind of like a green onion with a crazy long tail. So what you do is snip the roots off, um, snip the rest of it off, maybe at about the one foot mark. And again, you're left with something that looks very similar to a green onion. And it'll smell like lemon, even just handling it. You know, you'll smell that wonderful lemon smell. So usually what you do is you take it and, and break it up good, tie it in a knot, and throw it into a bowl of soup. And that lemony flavor will go out into the soup. So you don't eat it. Uh, you know, before you serve the soup, you know, uh, you know fish in there with a the spoon get the lemongrass out, but grows very well here in Houston, uh, grows quickly, very drought resistant, and it's easy to use, like I said, in any soups or stews you make. Quick question on the lemongrass. Uh, someone came in, I believe it's on Facebook. Uh, is it, uh, they've said that it, they've heard that it's good at repelling mosquitoes. Is, uh, is that true as well? Because <laughs> if that's the case, that's all I'm planning. <laughs> uh, you know, I haven't heard that. Um, I know that like a lot of your plants are, uh, you know, kind of bad insect repellent, you know, things like your lantanas and what have you, mm -hmm. garlic, most of your, your pests uh, don't like it. Um, you know, I've got lemongrass in the, um, in, in the backyard. I haven't noticed. Yeah, I have to admit, you know, it's been so hot and, and so dry for so long. I just haven't seen any mosquitoes around. I'll have to pay better attention. If somebody can Google it and let me know as well, I'd love to hear. Hey, well, you know what? It's not going to hurt anything. So uh, it's obviously you're eating it already. Go ahead and grow it. So, okay. I just wanted to jump into that. Lots of great uh, thumbs up and people loving it. Keep going, Benny. We're, we're doing good on time. We're at about uh, 35 after the hour. I know you've got a, um, a heart out. So just a reminder. All right. Thank you very much. All right. What else? Hey, so again, if you want to know what's yummy and good for dinner here, long beans. So if you're not growing long beans, you need to, because long beans are a better bean. So number one, if you grow normal green beans, one, you got to go looking for them, right? And they're usually camouflaged fairly well. They, they hide, you know, most bean plants are kind of bushy. Long beans grow on vines. What that means is that you can put a very nice trellis, uh, you know, plant your long bean seeds about six inches apart and you'll get these vines that go up. And what that means is you don't have some crazy bush where you have to go look for the beans. The beans will all be right there in front of you. And because the beans grow to about 18 inches long, they're very, very easy to see. What the vines will do is they'll grow maybe about a foot and then they'll make three beans as they continue to grow. You'll have three beans. And then once those beans are done, uh, all your vines will make three more beans, about another foot up. And so you slowly, you know, through the season, you harvest, you know, slowly working your way up the vine as the beans grow. And number one, you have lots of beans because you take them, snip them up with a pair of scissors and they'll look just like normal beans. But you know what? They're just a little more savory than American green beans. So if you want something that's yummy, something that, you know, the kids won't question, green, green beans, specifically these long beans are a very, very good way to go. Uh, loquat. Here's another item that you might have seen around your neighborhood. Again, you know what? We actually had a loquat tree in our front yard. I had no idea that the loquats were edible. Had a guy across the street was from the Middle East, and he came over one day, and he asked, can I eat your loquats? And I had no idea what the heck that was. He had to show me that, you know, that, you know, when the, when the tree uh, fruits, you know, it makes these little kind of fig-sized brown things. Um, ours, the tip of the, the variety that we had, they were kind of a sand color and they were kind of fuzzy like a peach on the outside. Uh, but when you take them and bite into them, just juicy and wonderful on the inside. They do have a seed that's a, kind of the size of a marble. So you kind of bite into it and spit the seed out and then eat the rest. But these are totally yummy. In fact, these are so yummy. My, my son at the time was in diapers 
And it got to the point where when we took him away from the loquat tree, he would cry. We had to start making rules that no son, you can't be out here at the loquat tree without parental supervision. So these are yummy to grow, very drought resistant. That's uh, just a beautiful tree, which is why they're uh, used in landscaping. Another fantastic thing about them is that they're an off season tree. You know, most of your trees, they'll bloom in the, in, in the spring and then, you know, fruit in the summer or fall. The loquats bloom in the fall, which is fantastic for your bees. Nothing else is blooming except the loquat trees. Be nice to your bees. So the uh, loquat trees bloom in the fall and then they make their fruit in the spring. So the fruit is ready first thing in the spring. So just beautiful tree, good fruit to eat, off season, nice for the bees. Uh, like I said, I, I have a hunch if you walk around your neighborhood, you'll find one of these if you don't already have one. Uh, just want to let you know the fruits are edible. They're not just edible, they're good. So hopefully you'll take a look and give it a try. Lufa. If you've ever thought that those scrubby things that you have in the shower came from some, you know, uh, you know, tropical sea sponge, no, they actually come from uh, a squash, specifically uh, the loofah. Uh, when you plant these things, uh, they're going to grow like cucumbers, right? You, you get these cucumber looking leaves. Uh, they're they're going to want to climb on something. They're going to climb up. Uh, one, they're kind of aggressive. I actually put these on my arbor last year. They cover the whole arbor, which was very nice because in the heat of the summer, that means I had nice green shade. And then they finally die back in the shawl in, in the fall. So when I finally was ready for some sun, uh, they were they were easing back. Um, but one, very easy to grow, uh, very heat tolerant, even if they are aggressive. Um, in Asian countries, they, they eat these. If you get the loofahs when they're about six inches long, you can treat it kind of like a, a, a little zucchini squash. So you can take these, you can cut them up, maybe slice them thin into a salad for a little difference in, in texture and what have you. Or a lot of times uh, you know, in Asian restaurants, they'll cut them in bigger chunks and so throw them into soups and stews. Uh, usually they'll peel off the outside. The inside is a little spongy, so this is weird. Imagine something nice and soft like a marshmallow that has the flavor of a cucumber. That's what these things are like. So like I said, get the little six inches, peel them, uh, use them. Uh, like I said, either slice in salads or throw them into soups and stews. You'll get that wonderful texture, that cucumber taste, very nice to eat. Or you can leave them on the vine, uh, let them grow to the end of the season, and they'll, they'll dry out. They'll actually... They'll get quite long. They'll probably get 18 or 20 inches long, big and fat around. Um, they'll, they'll dry in the vine to be brown. And when they dry in the vine to be brown, soak them in water overnight. The skin peels off very easily. And you will have a beautiful, perfectly white loofah scrubber that would love to go into your shower. So these things are fun, fun to grow. Just they look nice. Eat them. Take them in the shower. When you do peel them for the shower, they're full of seeds. You have to shake the seeds out of them. Those seeds will fix you up for next year. So just a, a very good crop to grow, very easy, heat tolerant. And like I said, it's fun to dry them and, and pass out the loofahs. All right, so let's go to Europe. So let's look at some European vegetables. And one of my favorites uh, from uh, Europe is uh, borage. And this is basically like a, a, a wildflower. It's like a wildflower in the sense that it, it does not appreciate being uh, transplanted. So I would never start these little guys in pots and then move them out later. You, you need to seed them where they're going to be. The plant also has kind of the shape of a wildflower. It has kind of a crazy, you know, wild uh, shape to it. But uh, the leaves are edible. If you pick a leaf and you taste it, the leaves taste like cucumber. Very nice. So you can, you know, snip them up into a salad or, or throw them into a soup. And the flowers also are completely edible. And the flowers also have the taste of cucumber. So it's absolutely beautiful. One, I just like, I like having color in my garden. My garden is also my landscaping. Our landscaping is my garden. Look at it however you want. These things add some, you know, some wonderful color to your garden. Uh, you know, look kind of nice, kind of wild, not so structured. And then, you know, to take those blooms and put them on top of a salad, Everybody oohs and awes over them. Number one, because it's beautiful. And then when you tell them, oh, it's all edible, you know, please eat them. They eat them and they love them. It's just, it'll it'll be the topic of uh, of the evening. So it's just very nice to grow. 
very nice to eat and use. All right, cilantro. Um, I'm really hoping you know what cilantro is. So this is not one of those exotic things that comes from around the world. If you're not familiar with cilantro, you need to catch up on your Tex-Mex. You need to go to a Mexican restaurant and eat some pico de gallo with your fajita tacos. And that way you can know what uh, cilantro is. It's one of the ingredients. It's the green ingredient of the pico de gallo. Um, the reason that we're talking about it is I hear a lot of people tell me that they, they tried to grow it. They couldn't get it to sprout. And so the reason I bring it up now is to let you know that, no, you don't need to scarify the seeds. You don't need to make little marks on the seeds. No, you don't need to put them in hydrogen peroxide to try to burn off them with some of that, that thick shell. All you need to do, put the seeds in a bowl, soak them in water overnight, and within you know, next day, a couple days, they will sprout for you. So again, uh, this is one of those one, those... Uh, you know, ethnic vegetables from around the world you should be familiar with. Uh, again, I just wanted to point out a good way to, uh, to sprout them. Uh, sorrel, here's another one that a lot of people find very interesting. I, mean, I have my neighbors, my neighbors always knocking on my, my door to see if they can come in my backyard and see what's growing now. And as I give the little tour, this is one of the ones I usually pull a, you know, pull a leaf off and I, and I hand to them to nibble on. And it tastes like green apples, not, not, kind of like green apples. I mean, it tastes exactly like green apples. So it's very nice, you know, get, you know, maybe like a, you know, a, a little bunch of this off of eBay or something like that. Uh, it'll grow into a bunch. The bunch will keep getting bigger and bigger so you can cut and come again. So it's one of those plants that just continually produces. And then, you know, next time you make a salad, you know, take some of this and just snip it in the salad. And, you know, as you're eating your salad with your different things in there, Here's a little zing that tastes just like green apple. I, I love the flavor. I get a lot of good comments. You know, the thing is I tell people here, taste this. It tastes like green apple and they always taste it. And then they look very surprised and they tell me it tastes just like green apple. I'm not quite sure why it's a surprise, but it's one of those ethnic vegetables good to eat. Try some, let me know what you think. All right, watercress. Here's another one of those ones that, you know, Again, if we could find a way to ship it to Africa, we could solve world hunger. You can get watercress in, uh, I don't know if you can get it like H-E-B or Kroger's, but you know, at Hong Kong Market or Fiesta, it's pretty easy to find. They sell it in a little bunch that looks an awful lot like cilantro, but put it in a cup, it'll root. And then uh, once it's rooted, you don't even need to plant it in dirt. Again, uh, like in the picture, you can just grow it in a tub of water. I've actually, this is part of an aquaponics system. It's, it's this, uh, this thing where you have fish in a tank and you kind of pump the fish water around. That's where your nutrients come from, but you don't even need fish for the uh, watercress to grow. You know, put it in a big bucket of water, or uh, I think these trays here are actually cement mixing trays from Home Depot. This stuff will go crazy. This is another one of those ones that once it really gets rolling, it'll double in size in a week. So it has a, a very spicy kind of raw radish taste to it. So, you know, snip a little bit into a salad um, or, you know, uh, throw some into a stir fry or a soup. But uh, it grows very nicely, very good to eat. I think this is another good one that you're going to like. And all right, let's go to India. And in India, we're going to talk about the Korean melon. And before you ask if I'm a, an American, if I'm a geographically impaired American, yes, I am. But I do know that Korea is not in India. Uh, the reason that we're talking about Korean melon in the Indian section is that these melons originally came from India and they spread on uh, the Silk Road. You know, think back to your, you know, your Marco, Marco Polo studies and what have you. They spread on the Silk Road. They're tremendously popular all throughout Asia. In fact, so popular, I guess, uh, the Asians have kind of hijacked the name. So now it's called the Korean melon. Uh, but this is another melon. In fact, um, I finally uh, was able to harvest some of these just recently. Very, very pleasantly surprised. You know, if everything is going to taste like a honeydew melon, then why do you need to grow a bunch of different melons? This one does not taste like a honeydew melon. This one, beautiful yellow on the outside. When you cut it open, it's white. It's white and very crispy. In fact, the crispiness reminded me of like a really good Washington apple. Not like an old squishy apple that, you know, is getting a little soft. Just wonderfully crispy. The taste is wonderful, and it's really got a flavor of its own. Uh, you know, when I was trying it, I started to tell my wife it tastes like a honeydew melon, uh, but not really. It's got a flavor of its own. 
Real quick, Benny, I want to go back, step back just a little bit. I had some questions come in about, uh, you mentioned the vegetables that grow well in water, and you said watercress, and I think there was a, do you have a list of other ones that maybe would be a good idea for if you have a water, you know, feature or, you know, some vegetable, a list of uh, vegetables that grow great in water? Uh, those three spring to mind. Uh, I, th I think we went through Chinese water chestnuts, uh, we went through Kang Kong, and then we went through watercress as well. Um, there aren't any others that spring to mind. You know, most of your, your, your vegetables kind of, kind of expect to be grown in dirt of some sort. And so when you move into the aquatics, there's not as much to choose from. I don't have a specific list and the, those are the only three that spring to mind. But I, I think if you Google aquatic edibles, I think you can find a list. I don't think it's going to be a long list, but I think that you can pretty easily find some others. So Awesome. Just wanted to check in real quick. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah. we're doing about, yeah, about 10 minutes, just FYI. Thank you very much. All right. So Korean melons, they're, they're going to grow again a lot like a cucumber. It's going to make a vine that looks like a cucumber vine. It's going to need some sort of a trellis to grow up. The nice thing about uh, Korean melons is, number one, like I said, they're totally yummy. I really like them. It was a very pleasant difference. Number two, they're pretty easy to find. If you've ever gone on an Easter egg hunt, you know, looking for your cucumbers, you know, you don't always find them all. Your Korean melons, you'll find them. They're about the size of a softball and bright yellow, so pretty hard to miss. All right, Malabar spinach. This is one of those ones that kind of gets passed around. If you have like a mother or a grandmother that has, you know, plants, she's probably got some of this someplace. What most people don't realize is it's edible. Um, I've never cooked with it. I, I don't think it would cook well, but the, uh, the smaller leaves are very tender. They're very nice. Pluck them, throw them in, in a salad. They're very shiny, very beautiful, and they kind of have purple veins in the leaves. So again, just some color variation, some texture variation. The leaves themselves have kind of a peanut taste. Uh, you do want to stick to kind of the smaller leaves, though. When the leaves get real big, they, they kind of get a, a, a little bit of a slimy feel to it. I didn't care for the big leaves as much. But the little ones, you know, this stuff is easy to find. Get some of it. It's, it, it's, it's beautiful when it grows. Pluck the little leaves. Uh, I, I think you'll enjoy it as well. I should say it makes these little tiny purple fruits. Uh, the, the little fruits, they're, they're tiny. They're, they're like smaller than a Cheerio even. So the fruits, you would never like, you know, sit around and think about eating the fruit. But when they drop, they stain things purple. So if you put this on a trellis, you know, don't, don't put it on the concrete of the sidewalk. Put it someplace else where the purple stains won't be a problem. Uh, real quick, Biddy, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Um, I had a lot of questions about the the water plants, uh, one being uh, how often you, would you change the water and uh, where might you, you, you find some of those plants in Houston? Um, the water, you know what? I don't change the water at all. I kind of put them, uh, my soaker hoses, I'm a big soaker hose fan. I actually lifted up my soaker hose and slid the tubs underneath. So in the morning when, uh, you know, my soaker hose is run, you know, it's dripping into those tubs as well. And so they automatically fill up, you know, some of the water evaporates out, um, you know, the new water fills it back up. Um, I think if you try it, especially like the water chestnuts, they, they really kind of go crazy and you end up with this, this big heavy thing inside the tub. I don't, I don't think you could conveniently, uh, change that water. Uh, maybe if you wanted to, you could kind of maybe siphon some off. Uh, but I don't change my water for any of that, for the Kang Kong, for the water chestnuts, for anything. Um, as far as where to get that stuff, the water chestnuts, you can get those from Hong Kong Market. Uh, don't get the frozen ones because they've been frozen and killed. Um, you know, go back to the produce section. You'll find them in uh, those little net baggies hanging up there. Um, they'll probably come with a, you know, a pack of a dozen or something like that. You only need one or two to sprout. So like I said, Hong Kong market for those, uh, the King Kong and what was the other one? Uh, watercress. You can get any, like, like a Fiesta or like a Hong Kong market as well. And we also have somebody post in the comment, Joseph's nursery. That looks like that might be one too as well. Would you be able to? That would be a good place to start. Yes. Great. Well, let's get back to it. All right. Let's see, uh, Moringa, here's a good one. And this is one of those ones you can find at Joseph's Nursery. When they sell it, it looks like a little kind of Charlie Brown, you know, tree. It's maybe a foot or two feet tall, kind of thin and scraggly looking. Has kind of a, a, a thin stem, but they grow very quickly. And very quickly, this thing will get to be 
um, five or six feet tall. And what's really nice, it's another cut and come again plant. Um, the leaves, you can eat them as they are. In fact, in South America, it's considered to be a superfood. Perhaps you've even heard of this stuff. You can get it at health food places like you know, powdered, dried and powdered and what have you. Uh, but you can get little trees to get in the ground. Uh, it is going to want some water. It's not real heat uh, or not. It's not drought tolerant. Um, but you know what? When, it, when it's salad time, you can walk outside with some scissors, snip some leaves off, throw them straight into a salad. Uh, I've never cooked with them. I could easily imagine you may be sprinkling some on a soup or a stew as it's being served. But very nice peanut taste. Uh, uh, just very nice, very easy to grow does kind of grow as a as a tall thin tree so usually i'll let it grow i'll snip it at about the one foot mark and it'll re-sprout and then when those sprouts are looking pretty good i'll snip those sprouts again and force it into kind of a bush shape so it grows very nicely grows very quickly tastes like peanuts i think you'll like it uh turmeric is another one uh, that grows uh, really well um Again, this is one of those ones that you, you've probably heard of. You've probably have had Indian food and turmeric is one of the ingredients in there. What most people don't know is again, when you go to the grocery store get these things and they will sprout for you. So you know, kind of like ginger, you know, put it in there. You gotta be a little patient, it's slow to come up, but it'll make what looks to be like a Kenya, maybe five or six feet tall. Uh, and, and it makes these wonderful blooms on it. So they get a little crazy. You might want to make sure that you have them in some sort of enclosed area. Uh, otherwise, they kind of start leaning out on the sidewalk, but just uh, easy to grow. Um, before you use it, you are supposed to boil it, dry it, powder it. That's how it's normally used in Indian food. I enjoy just growing it for the flowers. So there's a suggestion for you. It's in the grocery store. Give it a try. All right, we've got some South American vegetables. I feel like we're going to have to go really fast because we're running out of time. Uh, Kuka melon grows uh, a little melon. Again, this is a good one for limited space. You can put this in a container and it'll grow on a small trellis. Makes like a little tiny thing. It looks like a little watermelon, but it's a little cucumber. Pick them whole, throw them into salads. That'll be the talk of the, the evening as well. Just because people are fascinated to look at them. Uh, Kulantro. Uh, Actually, this actually uh, came from South America where the Asians love this. And if you've ever been to a, a pho restaurant, a lot of the pho restaurants uh, offer this. Grows in shade. Uh, don't use the pokey star-shaped tops, but the leaves and the stems, snip them up, throw them into soup, soups. Uh, very savory. Uh, prickly pear. Uh, there are a couple different kinds. There is a kind that uh, is spineless. Get them, slice them up. Uh, they'll cook up just like bell peppers, so you can use them in uh, fajitas or cut them into little cubes and throw them into a salad. I tell you what, there are a couple more here. I think we're basically running out of time. So uh, what we will do is uh, we'll chat the link to this presentation. That way you guys can look at the pictures and see all my notes. Lots more good things to try. There's even an appendix with some additional suggestions. If you'd like to do some additional reading, there's a lot of good books on Amazon. Uh, if you don't like buying books and can only buy one book, the book I would recommend is Edible Landscaping. This is from the lady that basically coined the term. Uh, you need to have a garden that's not just edible, but beautiful as well. And this book will help you get there. Benny, thank you so much. We are right now, as we speak, putting a lot of these, uh, all these links into the comments section right now. So they are available. Of course, this uh, presentation that you just gave uh, will be uh, visible for a long time and live on the web. So you can always refer back to it as a, uh, as a reference point. Um, thank you so much for your time. I, I wish we had more time. It was so interesting and there's so much more I want to talk about, but uh, uh, we'll get you back in again soon and we'll figure something out. But uh, once again, we are putting all those links in the, um, in the, uh, uh, in the comment section right now. Benny, thank you so much. Uh, I'll let you get to your meeting. I know you got a heart. I know you got a place you got to be. <laughs> once again, uh, remind everybody growing roses will be September 19th. Uh, please make sure you join us for that. Uh, and I'm sure we'll see Benny again. Um, Benny, anything else you'd like to say before we go? <laughs> again, thank you for standing in for my wife. <laughs>
<laughs> well, there's no standing in for her. So uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. And everybody, thank you so much for uh, uh, tuning in. We will be back on September 19th with Growing Roses in Texas. Have yourself a great one, guys. Bye -bye. Thanks all. Appreciate the time. Bye-bye.